Hey Parker, it is Wednesday, February the 4th, and your video yesterday reminded me of a selected essay that I had to read. It is called The Many Experiences of the Stereotype Threat by Claude M. Wheeler. This essay basically begins with a white student's enrollment in an African-American literature course. He is one of two students in said African-American literature course, and he feels like he has to prove he's not racist the entire time. I feel like your teacher was maybe not the best person to talk about this issue because she, in my opinion, did a few things wrong. It's actually technically impossible if you're going by literal definitions of racism for a for anyone really to be racist against white people. You can be prejudiced and discriminatory, but you can't really be racist because racism is based on a system of oppression and white people historically haven't been all that oppressed as a race. However, a black man can be racist against other black people. Um, this is due to the fact that he can possibly be continuing to perpetuate the oppression that has been systematically ingrained into him. I go to an HBC, which is a historically black college and university. In fact, if I remember right, Bowie State was the first black college in Maryland, or and it's one of the oldest in the country. It's celebrating its 150th anniversary this year, so yay! And so one thing I learned very quickly going to this HBCU is that when people are talking about your majority status as a white man, or in my case a white woman, they're not talking about you personally. They're talking about how historically white people have oppressed black people. I know you're not racist, and I know I'm not racist, but historically our race was racist. We can basically be here forever arguing about the difference between prejudice, discrimination, and racism, but that's just my two cents on the subject. But anyhow, I'm also going to briefly tell you about the story of a little girl who created the career field I'm going into. Mary Ellen's mother could no longer care for her infant daughter when her husband died, so she boarded her child with a woman, which was a very common practice at the time. Mary Ellen's mother then could no longer pay the woman to keep her child boarded, so the woman turned her turned Mary Ellen over to the Department of Charities, who then very illegally <laughs> just gave Mary Ellen away with no documentation or paperwork or processing or anything. Mary Ellen's quote-unquote foster father died and the foster mother remarried, moved to a poor part of town. Now this is when we go to a lovely Methodist missionary woman named Etta who, upon visiting this poor part of town, heard from one of her clients, a very sick woman named Mary Smith, that she often heard a child crying Etta investigated further and found out that little Mary Ellen Wilson was being severely beaten and abused by her foster family and went to the police. The police interpreted the current child laws in place and said, well, we're not going to do anything. At this point, went to a very unlikely source to get help for little Mary Ellen and the person she went to was the head of the ASPCA, American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. The head of the ASPCA then took Mary Ellen's foster family to court and had Mary Ellen removed. After this case, the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, which was the first organization of its kind, which is surprising because it was 1864, you would think that it would have been established by then, was created. I say this because, as you know, I'm a social work major and I want to work with children hopefully someday if I get accepted into the social work program at Bowie State. My professor kept bringing up the point that it really says something about us as a society, that we had laws in place to protect animals before we did children, so I'll let you make of that what you will. Mary Ellen's story does, however, end happily. She got married, had three lovely daughters, one of whom was a foster daughter herself. And she lived a good life after that. I'm assuming she's a very private woman. I'll link both of these things down in the doobly-doo. So that was just something I found incredibly interesting due to the direct correlation it has with my field. So I wanted to tell you about it. So I'll see you tomorrow, Parker. DFTBA.